So vibrational spectroscopy is commonly called infrared spectroscopy, or rather infrared spectroscopy is commonly called vibrational spectroscopy because infrared light has the energy required to excite these transitions here in the vibrational spectrum. Um, we've got to talk about some selection rules. There is a gross selection rule that molecules have to have in order to give rise to an infrared spectrum, and that is the electric dipole moment has to change during the vibration. So if we look at a molecule like carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is a linear molecule. So although each bond has a dipole moment, overall the molecule has no dipole moment. We might imagine one of these vibrations where the both bonds, the CO bonds, both stretch. This is the symmetric stretch. And the thing about the symmetric stretch is that it is infrared inactive. And so even though the vibration happens, infrared light is not absorbed by the molecule and converted into this vibrational mode. So it has to come from somewhere else, maybe collisions with one CO2 molecule with another. But if we look at one of the other vibrations, in fact, uh, we have 3n minus 5 vibrations for a linear molecule. So we've got 3 times by the 3 atoms, that's 9 minus 5. We should have 4 vibrations here. So another possible vibration is the one bond gets longer while the other bond gets shorter. And to keep the center of mass the same, that carbon has to move slightly. And so this leads to a lengthening of the bond on the right and a contraction of the bond on the left. If we look at the dipole moments here, we can see that they are proportional to the distance between the atoms. So the right-hand bond has a large dipole, the left-hand bond has a small dipole, and that gives rise to an overall dipole. So overall dipole, that is mu, that points from left to right here, at least from positive to negative. And so during this vibration, we see a change in dipole moment. And so this vibration here would absorb infrared light. And so we say that it is infrared active. If we look at carbon dioxide, we've got two vibrations. We've got two more to go. So what are the other two vibrations here? So we've done the symmetric stretch and the asymmetric stretch. The other possibility is these bending kind of motions like we saw for water. And so those two oxygens there can move down and this carbon can move up. And so this lifts or gives rise to this kind of structure here. If we look at the dipoles, we can see that this one here is one that has a changing dipole moment. And so the dipole moment starts off with zero. And as the vibration occurs, right, we see that the dipole moment changes. So it increases and points in the direction of the oxygens throughout the vibration. Those are three vibrations. And in fact, there is a fourth vibration. And the fourth vibration looks exactly like this vibration, except the oxygen molecules move towards us and the carbon atom moves away from us. And so imagine this top vibration that we've just rotated 90 degrees. And so imagine we're looking at the bending motion side on. And so the carbon's moving away, the oxygen's moving towards us. And so if we view from above, Okay, we can see that we really just are seeing the same motion we saw before. So these are at 90 degrees. In fact, these vibrations you might expect are exactly the same. So we call this doubly degenerate. So these are doubly degenerate vibrations. So instead of seeing an extra signal in the infrared spectrum, you would probably see these at exactly the same place.